Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second year talks in Wayne's Fest. Uh, my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Professor Philip Griffiths from the Institute for Advanced Studies. Talk about automotive homology and cyberspace. Thank you, and many thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give a call here. It's a great pleasure to be here in Selfie on uh, Glenn Sunday. The talk I'm going to give off uh, gift is based in part on some joint work with Watson and Turner. I'll first do a bit of an introduction and uh, then some history uh, that shows where the origin uh, both the cycle and automotive cohomology uh, came from many years ago. Then I'll talk a bit about flag domains and flag riders and flag domains. There'll be some bit of lead theory in this with roots and weights and so on. Uh, for those of you who are not in that universe, there'll be pictures of everything that I'll uh, talk about. So the two groups to keep in mind are the special unit character SP21 and the symplectic group SP4, four variables. Cycle um, spaces are uh, where they came from. And they're the main object of the talk, what we've got called correspondence spaces, which is something that lies over uh, both the flag domains and the cycle spaces. And it's these correspondence spaces that will play <clears throat> the central role in automorphic cohomology. Automorphic cohomology, the main tool that's going to be Penrose transforms that allows you to move cohomology back and forth between flag domains. And that will be the, uh, you know, the last topic of the talk. There's no final theorem, uh, but I think there are some suggestive uh, uh, so the partial results, many of them due to a uh, carryall, who I think revitalized the subject for me of automorphic cohomology by bringing in geometry, and for him, the interest was arithmetic. So, in general, the subjects of this talk are complex geometry and cycles, which, as I think you all know, Blaine uh, has worked in both and made fundamental contributions in both. The geometry is going to be the class of homogeneous complex manifolds that arose uh, first, I believe, in Hodge theory, um, and then <clears throat> going out of that in representation theory, where they were used extensively. The cycles that will appear will be compact, complex submanifolds of these flag domains, a very non-classical sort of logic for those people who work in permission symmetric spaces. And, um, you know, the sort of classical theory of Shimura varieties. And let's mention to the contrary, in fact, I'm going to restrict, restrict to the non-classical case where the flag domains will not fiber polymorphically over permission symmetric domains. So this takes us out of the classical realm of, of, of cohomology, whether it's elatic or coherent, or in the case of quotienting by discrete groups, polymorphic. For discrete co-compact and heat, that just means no elements in finite order. The quotients are going to be the objects of interest. And for each weight, there is a homogeneous line bundle over these quotients. Where the story began was the recognition that in the non-classical case, these line bundles had no sections. There are no automorphic forms in the classical sense. What there is, is if you take uh, weights that are sufficiently non-singular, meaning sufficiently far from the... Can you, can you say what the line bundle is? It's going to... I'll, I'll give the definition uh, below. So corresponding to a weight, uh, you get a uh, homogeneous line bundle. The one that's of most interest is the canonical bundle. So that would be the special one. So the cohomology, at least for sufficiently non-singular, meaning sufficiently far from the walls of vial chamber, is concentrated in one degree, which is not zero, and its dimension grows like a Hilbert polynomial. So the point is that there is a lot of automorphic cohomology, 
but it's just not a classical object. So what is this stuff? What's it good for? What is its geometric meaning? And in, in recent times, what is its arithmetic meaning? The cycle space, the first origin was that what you can do with this mysterious quantum cohomology is it's in the right degree to evaluate it on these compact complex manifolds. So this gives you a way of moving the higher degree cohomology into sections of the bundle. So I'll explain that. And even more fundamental than this will be the correspondence spaces which lie over both the flag domains and the cycle spaces and lie over pairs of flag domains. The Penrose transforms will move cohomology from here to here and are approaching by gamma. And what will happen is that in certain circumstances, this one will be classical. It's something that you understand automorphic forms. This will be non-classical, something that's been mysterious. The Penrose transform will give an isomorphism with the quotient by gamma. So that gives you a way of seeing this non-classical object through classical lenses. That's only part of the story, uh, as I'll explain at the end. That, in brief, is the outline. The bottom line will be that it's going to be possible to represent automorphic homology uh, which you can think of as check or debar by something global, holomorphic, somewhere else. Okay. And secondly, by doing this, you get some geometric and potentially arithmetic understanding of this uh, sort of mysterious object. The main references, I think, uh, the works of Wilfred Schmidt from the early 70s on discrete series. Uh, the book, just, well, the recent works of Cario, a book on cycle spaces by Bell, Huckleberry, and Wolf, and the forthcoming paper that I did with uh, Mark Green and Matt Kerr. A bit of a history. As I say, this began from Hodge theory. Just to recall what a polarized Hodge structure is, it's an algebraic object that looks like the cohomology of a compact injective algebraic variety. So you're given a vector space, everything is over Q, not Z. Um, a bilinear form is like a top product, and you're given a circle in the automorphisms of the real vector space preserving the bilinear form. Whenever you have a circle operating on a real vector space and you complexify it, it breaks into eigenspaces, where it operates by z to the power of p minus q in the pq eigenspace. And these are conjugate. So that's a Hodge structure. And then there are two bilinear relations of Hodge Riemann 1 and 2 that should be satisfied. They're not necessary for this, so I won't write them off. The set of polarized Hodge structures with given Hodge numbers, those dimensions, is a period domain. Classically, you think of elliptic curves. This is where everything began. The periods are points in the upper half plane, and that's what the period domain is in that classical case. Or if you do a union varieties, it's the Siegel upper half space of genus G. The first non-classical case is weight two. That's like the second cohomology on algebraic surface. This is what the hot, the hot numbers H and K, the period domain, is a quotient of an indefinite orthogonal group. The signature comes from the hot Riemann bilinear relation. And the stability group of a given Hodge structure is a compact subgroup because it preserves this direct sub decomposition where various Hermitian forms have assigned positive or negative definite. Period domain then is a set of such decompositions satisfying the Hodge Riemann bilinear relation. And if you collect the two ends together and put the middle one there, both of these are defined over the reals. They're invariant under conjugation. So the two H signature is here and the K signature is there. And these are the two Hodge Riemann bilinear relations in this case. 
So the compact subvarieties are given by the Lagrangian planes of dimension H and the W here. You just look at subspaces that satisfy this relation. And then as a consequence of the signature, they will satisfy this. So the Lagrangian Grossmannian is a compact projective algebraic variety sitting in this period domain. When the pod number is one, this has dimension zero, it's just two points. That's the case of K3 surfaces, that's classical. But as soon as H is two, this is positive dimensional. So this is the first case of a cycle, if you like. And so it's a P1 sitting in this period domain. When this first happened, uh, coming from the point of view of algebraic geometry, this was in the 60s, nobody had ever seen a family of algebraic surfaces uh, whose Hodge decomposition varied, but which was parametrized by P1. You have to have singular fibers. It wasn't a theorem, but if you look in the Italian literature, and if you'd ask Enriquez if he'd been around, he said, such thing doesn't exist. So something is strange about these period domains that's not classical. And that's really what one of the first suggestions that life is different in higher weight. Just for later reference, the period domain that sits in a projective variety, which is just the uh, Lagrangian Grossmannian of planes of dimension H in this complex vector space. More general than period domains are lumped with pink domains, and the easiest definition is, uh, is the following. It's going to be a subdomain of a period domain, and it's going to consist of polarized Hodge structures with additional structure. And the additional structure is that you look at the tensor algebra, and you take a subray or subalgebra, and you look at all polarized Hodge structures whose Hodge ray, the set of Hodge classes, those are the ones which are of type PP and are rational, such that the Hodge algebra is, in, that set of polarized Hodge structures, Hodge algebra is contained in a fixed one. So if you like, it's the set of polarized Hodge structures of a certain type having a whole bunch of Hodge classes in its tensor algebra. These things are all quotients of reductive um, real Lie groups by compact subgroups that contain a compact maximal torus. And in fact, there's, that's an if and only if. So the Mumford Tate domains are much more general than period domains. They include all quotients of reductive real Lie groups by compact subgroups that contain a compact maximal torus. To give a non-classical example, you take a uh, rational vector space with a four and an action of a quadratic imaginary. And then if you tensor the vector space with a uh, field, that splits into conjugate eigenspaces. And the polarized Hodge structures that have an action on them by <coughs> this field can then be pictured as follows, that they break into the conjugate pieces where the Hodge number H30, H21, H12 appears in the plus, and the conjugate ones appear there. And so that's the sort of picture <coughs> of the Hodge structure. So H30 is here, H03 is here. The C3, the complex vector space, has this Hermitian form of signature 2, 1. And the way to picture this is uh, this is just the group theoretic description. The compact dual is sitting in a projective plane because it's a line sitting, a point sitting in a line sitting in C3. So it's just the flag variety in C3. So if you like, it's an incidence variety of points and lines for the point on the line here. That's what the compact dual is. Very simple object from projective geometry. The buffer tape domain are all pictures like this. This is the unit ball. So it's the point on a line where the point is outside the ball. That's the Hodge Riemann bilinear relation for this. And the line meets the ball. That's the Hodge Riemann bilinear relation for that. So it's a very something you can easily picture. 
fact, there are three open orbits of this real lead group operating on the compact dual. And this one we just talked about, and this one where the point is in the ball, and this one where the point's outside and the line is outside. These two fiber over the ball, this map of the point or the line. So what you see are three open orbits uh, sitting in the compact dual, one of which is non-classical and two of which are classical. So how are these going to be related? That's really the sort of underlying geometric point. Can one see the non-classical guy uh, from these classical ones? Can you write down an automorphic cohomology class in coordinates as looking something like an automorphic form in classical literature? And then you can talk about its arithmetic and, uh, properties. <coughs> the compact subvarieties in this case are just parameterized by points in the ball and lines outside the ball, the P ones, and the compact subvariety consists of all configurations where you have a point here, a little P, outside the ball and the line little out. So that's a P1 a point in this domain. I think the additional example, I'm not going to give it here, but that's the case of weight three, the sort of Kalabi now Meroquintic type of variety, but I think just because of the time I'll draw pictures of that, uh, but I think I'm not the one here. So some generalities about flag varieties and flag domains. I say maybe I should just go back because it's a nice picture. The picture in this case is you look in P3, you have a four-dimensional vector space, and you have all that vector space in all the data form. So you can again look at Lagrangian, but relative to the alternating form subvarieties. And the maximum dimension is a line. So the compact dual consists of Lagrangian flags, a Lagrange line, and a point on that. The period domain is an open orbit where the Hermitian form that you're given is positive on the point, but has signature 1, 1 on the line. So that's the picture of the Mumford Tate domain sitting in this compact dual. And the picture of the compact subvarieties in this case, you take two Lagrangian lines, one where the Hermitian form is positive, one where it's negative. And for each point here, there's a unique point there, which is orthogonal relative to the Hermitian form and is on this line. So for each point here, you get a point in this Mumford Tate domain, a point where the form is positive and a line where it has mixed signature. So that's a P1 sitting in this flag domain. Flag varieties and flag domains, you begin with a vector Q algebraic group, they have associated Lie groups, and the assumption throughout is that the real Lie group contains a compact maximal torus. There are two equivalent conditions on this. One is that it's a monthly tape group, this reductive Q algebraic group, and this is a monthly tape domain. Not in a unique way, in many different ways. And you can guess that's the case because if you take a polarized hot structure, you can apply any tensor operation to it, and you'll get again a polarized hot structure of a different weight. So, but it will be have the same underlying monthly tape domain as a geometric object. Okay, so that's one equivalent condition to this assumption. The other is that the real Lie group has discrete series representations in L2. So how are these related? One algebra geometric, one representation theoretic. A flag variety, these are familiar objects in representation theory. It's a complex uh, vector Lie group functioned by a Borel subgroup, maximal solvable subgroup. And then if you like, it's the set of conjugacy classes of the Borel subgroup. And in the pictures I drew before, uh, they're sort of familiar flag variety type objects. A 
A flag domain is an open orbit sitting in this thing of a real form of a complex group. So if you take a given complex group, like a unitary group, or I'm sorry, a general linear group, it'll have many real forms. Some are indefinite unitary groups, like U2, P cubed, or P plus Q is a, that was like the SU21 thing, or the U21 thing. But they also have a compact real form, which is just a unitary group. Here we're interested in open orbits in D hat uh, of essentially non-compact real reductive Lie groups. So this is isomorphic to the real Lie group by a maximal torus. And I just wrote down here what that maximal torus is. It's complexification of the Cartan center. Just for later reference, the notation of the standard one from Lie theory. I won't get into this because it's just roots and weight stuff. And as I say, all of the ones we'll be concerned with, you'll be able to see the pictures of the roots and weights. But just for reference, the, yeah. you have the weight space decomposition, you have the root space decomposition, you have the set of roots which break in the compact and non-compact ones that break into a carton decomposition. And the important point here are the vial groups which are the normalizers of the Carton subgroup in the large group. There are two vial groups. Uh, there's first the big vial group, the normalizer of the Carton subgroup and the complex group. And choosing a set of positive groups is the same as choosing a fundamental domain for the vial group. You'll see the pictures of that so called vial chamber. So giving a set of positive groups is the way of describing the complex structure here. The equivalence classes of homogeneous complex structures on a compact form by its maximal floors are equivalent to a choice of a positive vial chamber. That gives you one zero tangent space at the origin if you, if you write out there. In the non-compact case, the open orbits are uh, one-one correspondence with the equivalence classes of homogeneous complex structures on this quotient, and those are in one-one correspondence to the vial group of the compact group, the little vial group. And the standard notation in Lie theory is one half the sum of the positive groups. So the pictures for issue two one. This is the picture of the vial chamber, and there are two classical complex structures one non-classical one, and this is the action of the compact power group, which is reflecting off the vertical axis. So there are three here that we saw before. So that's before, this is the picture. There's two classical ones and two non-classical ones. And the magic uh, weight row or minus row is drawn in here. Those will be the weights that give line bundles that are very special. They are square roots of the canonical bundle. And they're the ones, from the point of view of representation theory, that correspond to totally degenerate limits of discrete series. What got me interested in this, among other things, is that if you think about algebraic geometry, you think about algebraic curves, on algebraic curves, they're sort of general line bundles, those which have no H1, they have only H0 or about duality, only H1, but no H0. And then there's the special line bundles, the things that fall between degree 0 and 2G, the special divisors. And in the special divisors, there are the very special divisors, those in degree G minus 1. And among the very special divisors, there's a very, very special one where the line bundle is the square root of the canonical bundle. The totally degenerate limits of discrete series, the, the automorphic homology corresponding to them, to me smells like special divisors in this particular degree in algebraic geometry. They have very much that flavor. They're, they're deeper than sort of general homology groups. For example, a really characteristic is zero. So you can't get at them with any sort of only characteristic or Hilbert polynomial argument. You have to go deeper into the structure. The homogeneous line bundles given any weight, that is a character of the torus. 
and it has a unique polymorphic extension to the Borel and the corresponding line bundle when you take the standard construction of a homogeneous vector bundle, in fact, over a homogeneous space given by a representation of the isotopy group. This is the standard construction. And in particular, the canonical bundle is the one corresponding to the weight minus two rho, it'll be one half the sum of the roots. Kadara center duality looks like this when you take a compact function. So you see here the L minus rho here on both sides. That suggests what to me was very mysterious from the point of view of the people in representation theory, but geometrically is very natural, that whenever you're doing bookkeeping with weights, you shift by rho. The representation theorists say you shift by rho to make the Hiroshima mapping a mapping of algebras, the Hiroshima isomorphism and isomorphism onto the invariance of the symmetric product of the uh, of the uh, Cartan subalgebra modulo of the bio group. Coming back to the mushroom take domains, one of the first properties they have is what sort of pseudo-convexity might they have. Anytime you have a non-compact complex manifold, from the point of view of complex function theory, you say, is it a Stein manifold? Or how much does it look like a Stein manifold? <coughs> Here the answer is that it looks like a Stein manifold above the dimension equal to the dimension of the maximal compact subvariety. So that it, it's as Stein as it can be. In a, com open, in a non compact complex manifold, if you have compact subvarieties, it can't be Stein. Here we have a whole bunch of them because we have one proportion of the maximal compact subgroup by the maximum force, and you can move that around in the domain. In fact, you fill it out that way. So it can't be a Stein manifold, but it's as close as possible. So the precise statement is that you take the invariant metrics in the Cotangent bundle, their ratio gives you a function on P, and the lady form of that function uh, gives you an exhaustion function, that is, it goes to infinity at the boundary, and it's the, oh, I'm sorry, the function gives you an exhaustion function, and this lady form has the maximum number of positive eigenvalues it can have. So the simplest example is just the unit disk sitting in P1, and this is the function you get here. So what this means is that the cohomology for A coherent G vanishes above the dimension of this maximal compact subrise standard uh, Andreotti Brower type of vanishing zero. The curvature implications uh, for these line bundles, they are having variant permission metrics, so they have natural curvature forms in various of the group. And the number that turns up here is, well, first I mentioned earlier that D is non-classical if and only if it has no uh, there are no sections of a quotient, no automorphic forms. The magic number is the number of compact roots, this is for a weight, which have negative value when you use the uh, carbon chilling forms in their product, plus the number of non-compact roots where this is positive. And then the signature of the curvature form The signature of the curvature form of the line bundle is just this number. It has that many uh, positive eigenvalues, the curvature form. So this is what leads to using the Atiyah Singer theorem, what I mentioned earlier about there being a lot of automorphic cohomology. It's concentrated in one degree for the very non-singular ways, but it's not in degree zero. Turning now to uh, representation theory, um, back in the early 70s, Wilfred Schmidt proved that if you look at this cohomology where you take a weight that's in the anti-dominant bowel chamber, it's where that minus rho was in those pictures. 
it's the opposite of the dominant biochamber, that this is an irreducible Parachandra module with this uh, infinitesimal character. What Wilfred was interested in was realizing the discrete series by L2 homology. And provided the weight is non singular, the L2 homology gives you the discrete series. But for singular ones, you have a limit of discrete series. And for the most singular one, that's where mu is minus rho, so mu plus rho is zero, has infinitesimal character zero, you get the most special, if you like. Uh, or modules. So this is a picture uh, for SU21. This is the dominant ion chamber. This is the anti-dominant one. And the limits of discrete series, you picture it like sitting in a ion chamber and moving to a wall. For this minus rho, the very special one, you move to the origin. And for SP4, there are two limits of discrete series corresponding to the two non-classical complex structures. Turning now to cycle spaces, uh, the cycle spaces the location is you have uh, one of the homogeneous complex manifolds, the flag domain, the maximal complex subvariety, which you can think of just like P1 is the quotient of SL2C by Borel, it's also the quotient of SU2 by a torus. So it can be written as either. Either the quotient by a compact group divided by maximal torus or the complexification divided by a Borel. The definition of the cycle space is all of the deformations of your reference cycle by moving it around in the complex group and keeping it inside the domain. That's the definition. So you just, if you like, it's part of the Hilbert scheme of the thing in the compact dual, but it's a special part because you get the compact subvarieties by moving by the complex group but staying inside your domain. And so much characterization of non-classical is this U is an open set in GC by KC, the complex group divided by the complexification of the maximal complex subgroup. This is the stability group of a reference cycle. So for SU2, comma 1, we're looking at these pictures we had before, where the compact subvariety is given by a point in the ball and a line outside the ball. So the U is isomorphic to the ball across the conjugate of the ball. The conjugate of the ball are just lines outside the ball viewed as points in the dual projective space. For SP4, again, it's the product of the zero upper half space cross its conjugate. So among the Lie groups, those break into two types. One is those of Hermitian type, such that the real Lie group operates on a Hermitian symmetric domain with it somewhere. These are the Hermitian types, and for these, this U is a rather simple object. But for things like the Fondo group, or G2, which is a very, you know, very interesting group in this story, it's not classical, it's not Hermitian type, but in fact, in general, U is a sign manifold. There's an argument, which I think I won't go through, that shows how to construct the strictly fluorescent harmonic exhaustion function from the one that you had on the original D. On the original D, you simply take the function you had there, the exhaustion function, and look at the maximum value on a complex subvariety, and you get a strictly fluorescent harmonic exhaustion function of this cycle space. The deeper structure of this is to Akhaiser and Dinkin. They use the even solid decomposition where you take a maximal uh, abelian subgroup of P, the non-compact part in the Cartesian decomposition. And then you take its roots, which are called restricted roots. That decomposes the Lie algebra in a different way than the Cartesian subgroup. Decomposed now according to the maximal abelian real 
subgroup of P in the Cartan decomposition. And what the Dinkin and Icosia and Dinkin proved was a description of this U in GC by HC. To mention that this U, the cycle space, is acted on by the real Lie group because it leaves the domain fixed. So any compact subvariety moves into another one in the domain. But the orbit structure is very subtle. This is the Kandinkin, Archiser, and Otsuki, and so on story. What they gave you was a precise description of this U as taking the exponential of a fundamental domain in this A, where the roots are less than pi over 2, and operating on that with the real leap group. So if you like, the real leap, real orbits are parameterized by this thing in the imaginary part of uh, P, the, the Cartan decomposition. That has an amazing corollary, at least to me, because what it means is that the cycle space doesn't depend on which month of tape domain you began with. It's the same for all of them. Because this is what the thing is. It doesn't depend on your particular choice of a, of a month of tape domain, a positive root system for the Cartan subgroup. All it depends on is this beta here. So that means that because of universality, there is some way of relating the geometry of all these Mumford Tate domains to something universal. Their cycle spaces are all the same, even though they're very different. Ultimately, we're interested in automorphic cohomology, and so you need to quotient by these uh, discrete groups. And then there's a very beautiful theorem, uh, the Burns, Hubbard, and Hinn that basically says that you can pass to the quotient and still get stimulus, uh, both for u by gamma and later on when we do the correspondence space w by gamma. This is, applies much deeper than just the pseudo-convexity of the cycle space. It's a very intricate, very beautiful argument using the geometry of the restricted groups and how they fit together Probably orthogonal systems of such, and you see you know this stuff that we do. There's an interesting question here. There's a very natural exhaustion function in the cycle space. Just take the invariant metric on D, and just take the volume of the cycle of the subcompact subvariety. All the indications are that this is an exhaustion function. Now, the compact subvariety goes to the boundary, it goes to infinity and that it's strongly plurisubharmonic. That would give you a proof of this theorem, which is geometric, if you like. And uh, this is an unknown. Uh, uh, I think a number of people, certainly Mark and myself, trying to prove this. And you get into the fine orbit structure of the real Lie group on this cycle space. And then you get things that, so far, we're just not able to uh, calculate. The next part of the story are these correspondence spaces. Uh, I'll draw the pictures up in a minute. The formal definition of the compact dual is you take the complexity group and factor by the complexification of a maximal force. So the way to think of it, if you think of flag manifolds, these would be frames. Because if you have a projective frame, all you can do is scale each vector. So the factoring by this means you scale the projective frame. <coughs> so that's the way I think of this. These are projected frames. If you have these bilinear forms, then they're Lagrangian, they have Lagrangian properties. So I think of them as projected frames. This thing maps onto the, comp uh, the compact dual of D and also the cycle space. So it lies over both. And it has special properties that the fibers over this are contractible. The fibers over this are just these projected <coughs> frames, not for the full group, but for the maximal compact subgroup complexified. So there's a fair amount of geometry in this picture.
the basic diagram then is the part of this W that lies over D. You just take the open orbit sitting in this compact dual and take the inverse image up here. And you get this diagram. From this, it follows that W is Stein. That follows from the properties of this vibration. And the fibers, in fact, in these two are essentially those in the dual picture. So they can be understood. This object uh, has a sort of mixed algebra and geometric function theoretic um, uh, character. Function theoretic is U is like a bounded domain of holomorphy. We saw examples where it's just a bounded symmetric domain across its conjugate. And in general, it's a Stein manifold which has a Kobayashi, a complete Kobayashi metric. So it's like a bounded domain in CN, a homomorphy. The fibers of this thing are these uh, projected frames for the complex complexification of the maximal compact group. So they're affine algebraic varieties. So this gadget here has a mixed algebra geometric on the fiber, function theoretic character on the base. It's operated on by the real Lie group. So the functions, say the whole morphic functions on this, it's a sum manifold, are uh, representation space for the real Lie group. But it's not a standard type of object. It's not a, uh, the functions are not a Hiroshima module. You don't have the K finding this condition. On the other hand, if you sort of filter this by taking the algebra geometric part, those are functions on an affine variety, and just filter them by their order of pole and infinity, then the successive quotients are Hiroshandra modules. So it's some sort of infinitely iterated extension by essentially polynomial rings of Hiroshandra modules from a representation theoretic point of view. The picture of the script W uh, for the first one is just a frame where one point is in the ball, the second and third points are outside the ball, and the line joining them is outside the ball. It maps to the domain by just taking this configuration and mapping to the line and the point, that's in D, and it maps to a cycle space by taking this point and the line joining them. And there's a similar picture, which I won't go through, for the SP4 case. So it's these are things in low dimension that you can hold in your hand, so to speak. And the sort of geometric or function theoretic properties that you can do by hand in these cases, uh, the ones I'm aware of are all general. You can prove them in general once you understand these low dimensional pictures. This is a picture of this correspondent space fibering over a non-classical and a classical one. So you take a projective frame here and you map it down to P comma L, that's in the non-classical domain, and you map it to P prime comma L, that's in the classical one. So that's how this correspondent space lies over non-classical and classical stuff. The next part of the story is this result of Eastwood, Ending, and Wong. And I'll run through this very quickly. They have a general theorem. It's a very simple theorem once you see it as a theorem. And it's extremely, I think, a rather deep observation. If you have a Stein manifold factoring over a complex manifold with intractable fibers, you have a whole working bundle here. Their question is, how can you see the cohomology of this thing uh, purely holomorphically without getting into D bar and all of that? And their theorem is that you do a construction, you pull the sheath back, you pull the vector bundle back up here, you take relative differential forms, and the theorem is that the sheath cohomology downstairs is isomorphic to the global. The ROM cohomology upstairs. 
So it's a way of taking sheet cobalt and a compact complex or a complex manifold, and if you have this picture of it, it's lying under a stein manifold of tractable fibers, it becomes a global holomorphic object. And moreover, in the cases where you have groups operating, you frequently get harmonic forms on the right-hand side. So it's not just the wrong cobology as a quotient of closed, not exact, global holomorphic stuff, but there'll be unique representatives. Yeah. And it's confect. And it's anything. Let me not be all, all very general theorem. Okay. Um, this is fine. Contractible fibers, any complex metal holder. This leads into Penrose transforms, where you have this compact picture containing the open part, and you have two complex, you have two open orbits, a D and a D prime. You remember that the open orbits correspond to choices of positive roots. So the way to compare two open orbits is to look at the roots that change sign when you move from one vial chamber to another. That's the set S. The positive roots for D intersect the negative roots for D prime. Now both those subsets of the positive roots have the property that they and their complement are closed under addition. That's the sort of critical feature of it. And vice versa, given any subset of those properties, if it corresponds to such a picture. What this car suggests is that you look at some object that reflects the number of roots that change sign. And here I'm using the dual of the root vectors. I'm thinking of the Mara Carton forms on the group red product them, and then you use the Eastwick and Mink and Wong isomorphisms together with cup products by this thing, reflecting the number of roots that can be assigned. So if you like, that's the change in complex structure going from D to D prime. That's the Penrose transform. It's a way of moving cohomology from D to D prime via this Eastwick and Mink and Wong mechanism. This whole picture, by the way, I should mention just as an aside, makes sense in the compact case, not just the open domain case, but the compact case. So there you have two different complex structures on the quotient of the real complex group by Borel's, two different Borel's. But the Borel's are all conjugate to one another. So it's the same complex structure. So what does the Penrose transform give you there? It gives you the isomorphisms in the borel box zero. Remember, Ralph Burrell they Bach say that the sheaf homology for these homogeneous line bundles over flag varieties can be realized as cohomology groups in different ways. And the ways that they are realized traditionally is via representation theory. So you can ask, okay, here you have two cohomology groups on the same compact complex manifold in this case that are isomorphic as modules over the group, as representation spaces, how are they related geometrically? And the answer is, going back to this Penrose transform, but you do it over here in the compact case, where this and this are the same complex manifold. That's the isomorphism in the world they bought. What happens if you do this twice? You go from D to D prime and then come back to D to back. I'm slipping. Uh, you have to. There's a duality that you have to throw in. So I'm finessing a little bit at that point. So this is an evolution. There's an evolution. That's where this twist by taking the dual and using the ship by the row comes in. So one question that's very natural is under what conditions is this Penrose transform when you quotient by a compact group? Uh, injective. In the compact case, uh, because of Morel de Bond, uh, it's either zero or it's an isomorphism. Uh, the answer to this is not known. In fact, very little is known. There's uh, a couple of necessary conditions that both these 
integers must be less than or equal to b, and the infinitesimal characters must be the same. There are no examples known where these conditions that are necessary are not sufficient. Uh, I think I was going to go through the argument of uh, how this is proved, but uh, I think that uh, is going to run into time problems, so I'll just say the theorem that in the case, say, of SU2, comma, 1, uh, you have injectivity of the Penrose transform from an H0. That's a classical object. This is a bounded symmetric domain. And this is a line bundle over it. Well, later on, we'll quote you by a discrete group. This is the non classical guy. And this is what these integers have to satisfy. Remember, we're sitting in P2 across its dual. So each line bundle has a bi degree. It's the degree off P2 and the degree off the dual. That's what the A and the R. And this is injected in a certain range. The important point is that in for the case of a canonical bundle over here, to any power big enough, this is injected. These things here will correspond to the current automotive forms in the quotient by gamma. So think of this as being some sort of classical guy, something that you can write down. And this is the non-classical one. And that's the basic mechanism, which I think I will not go into. To finish up that, I wanted to say, when you go to automorphic homology, uh, what the story is. So we need curves to use this two-swooping ink and walk there, but these quotients are signed, and the fibers are contractible. And that follows just essentially from just doing some structure theory. Or, in the case of the two examples, you can draw the pictures that will show you that it's true. So the Eastwood and Lincoln Wong picture applies here. And it also applies when you take the quotient by D prime over here. So there are two ways this correspondence space is used. One is lying over D in the cycle space. One is lying over classical D and the non-classical deep, uh, deep drive. So the main theorem so far is that in the two examples where you have Picard modular forms or Zico modular forms of high enough weight, the Penrose transform is an isomorphism. The first one is through the carryall, and the second one is in the paper that I mentioned with Mark and, um, and Matt. Once you know it's objective, then all you need to know to prove an isomorphism is equality of dimensions. And there's an argument for here for this that gets into, really gets into representation theory, so-called entomology, which I will not uh, go into. It relies really on the works of Schmidt who computed his entomology uh, in the cases of interest here. So at least in some non-classical case, these automorphic uh, homology groups, I left the word out there, they have classical interpretations. So for example, if you go back to the original Mumford Tate domain for SU21, these polarized hot structures of weight three with an axiom by a quadratic imaginary field. And you say you have automorphic homology in dimensions one and by duality of two, nothing in zero and three. Those are the two uh, zero in the top dimension. What does the stuff look like? So you can write down formulas by just tracing through what the Penrose transform is in coordinates and taking a concurrent or more form. And what you see is some sort of arithmetic structure. Uh, the Picard automorphic forms have an arithmetic structure for very classical reasons. This is the whole Shimura variety universe. So the question is, what about the Penrose transform? Does that take arithmetic stuff to arithmetic stuff? And there, just by having explicit formulas, you can see that's the case. 
So this is imprecise so far. The question in general is, do these groups have an arithmetic structure, meaning it is in a canonical way these complex vector spaces, the, do they have a Q-bar structure? Is there a vector space of a Q-bar whose tensor product is C, is this, and which has suitable functoriality or naturality properties? For classical algebraic forms, there are many ways of doing this. Uh, you know, one of the traditional ways is expand the automorphic form about a cusp and look at the coefficients. Uh, I can uh, use a pack of operators and so on. The thing that, the reason this is of interest material is that in this particular case, the most degenerate uh, Heracondro modules, the totally degenerate limits of discrete series, uh, they are inaccessible to this theorem on the previous board. Uh, to this theorem. You don't get the interesting one from the Penrose kind of board. <laughs> so even though some of these automorphic cohomology groups, the ones you get by Penrose transform from something classical, have an arithmetic structure, to the representation theorists, this is not so interesting. They want to get at the one corresponding to the totally degenerate limit of discrete series, the most special, special, special divisors in the case of algebraic curves. That's the case where V was minus rho, infinitesimal characters in rho. And what Cariel had was a beautiful idea. Uh, namely, he showed a uh, very ingenious argument that wrong. Uh, he said, well, we can't get at the individual groups by a Penrose transform. But maybe we can trans Penrose transform something classical and take cup products to get out the thing we're interested in. So this was the sort of picture. Uh, you take two different classical ones. I just brought here the C prime. These are the weights that correspond to the uh, Picard automorphic forms. These are the weights that Penrose transforms to those. So you picture if you take the one for C prime and the one for C double prime, where this stuff now goes below. And you add up this point to the opposite point there, you get up here. So just the picture says, let's do a cup product and see what comes out. And what Carrie will prove, essentially, is that this cup product map is surjective. And by Kadaris air duality, you get the thing, the mysterious object here. So that is very suggestive. That says the thing you're interested in is the quotient of two arithmetic things. All you need is that the kernel of this map is arithmetic. That's not known so far. Uh, I know Kerry has tried to do it, Richard Taylor's tried to do it. Uh, it's a deep question in the sort of arithmetic algebraic geometry universe. Can you use a tall theory on this one? Uh, the reason, the philosophical reason they say is whenever you do a tensor product, whenever you do a cut product, you have a tensor product of something somewhere. And they say Packout operators don't like tensor products. So, I mean, the people from arithmetic representation theory, I think, will understand that much more than I do. Uh, but, I mean, there seems to be not just that it's hard, can't prove it, but there's a philosophical reason. So that suggests other ways of getting happier in that structure, which I don't, I don't have a chance to go into. I'll just close by saying that for SP4, the story is a little bit more interesting because you have not just one, but two totally degenerate limits of the street series. So any statement here is going to have to involve interactions between those. And the uh, 
the bottom line is that the same cup products that you could hold, somewhere right here. Um, yeah, you have to cut product in H1 into an H3. Or H1 into an H2 goes into an H3. If you work out the pictures, you end up with pictures like this. And then the same result about the first activity of the cut product uh, hold. So it's similar to what Carroll did. It's a little more interesting, but once you know he did it for H2-1, then it's this suggests that there is some generality to what he did, I guess the way I would put it. But the next one's up, which shows the difference. The one new phenomenon you expect is when you have a whole, not when you have several totally degenerate limits of this big series, what about the cut product story? And the SP4 case answers that. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Are there any questions for the speaker? So what's the general feeling of all their necessity for the smell that it's going to always have to make a nice flavor at the end? Um, it's certainly the, the, the arithmetic um, aspect of it is something I know very little about. It seems to be very interesting. I think for me, the initial interest was this mysterious object of automotive homology that appeared in the early days of Hodge theory, which the representation theorists understood to some extent, but uh, it had no geometric meaning, no Hodge theoretic meaning. Uh, it was only when Carriol wrote his paper, which sort of began to reveal the geometry, and it, that's, I think, what was an interesting day. And in particular, these very special uh, totally degenerate limits of this big series, which are like special dividers on curves. So geometrically, there's still you know, just the beginning, perhaps, of some story. But the arithmetic side, I just don't Let somebody else has to. He has not. Any other questions? Thank you.